With internet applications, we're just going to go through one very simple example. There are many different internet applications. We mentioned that we use domain names as user-friendly ways to identify computers. When computers send packets, they use IP addresses, but we may use a domain name to identify the computer. We also use We also use URLs to identify resources on computers. There are some different structures. And importantly, the domain name system provides a way for mapping a domain name to an IP address. When you type in a domain name in your web browser, your web browser wants to know the IP address of the destination, not the domain name of the destination. So the domain name system which includes a protocol, allows for finding the answer. That is, the question is, what is the IP address for this given domain name? DNS finds the answer. We don't have time to go through it in any detail. We'd need a, a, almost a full lecture to cover into the detail that I'd like to. So we're going to, in fact, skip over the details so we can cover just HTTP. But the main point is, given an input of a domain name, DNS will find the corresponding IP address. You start your web browser, you type in a domain name, DNS goes to work, we'll skip the details of how it does it, goes to work and finds the IP address for that corresponding domain name. That's one thing you need to know. We'll see an example of that after we go through HTTP. What's your favorite internet application? What's your favorite internet application? Uh, Skype. Skype. Anyone else? What's your favorite internet application? <laughs> MSN. So here's two examples, a voice application, an instant messaging application, your favorite. Another one? BitTorrent, or a torrent application for file transfer, file download. Another one? Firefox, web browsing. So four common internet applications that most of you know and have used. We're going to focus just on one. That is, we're going to focus just on how web browsing works. Everyone uses a web browser, and perhaps the protocol is one of the simplest. Your web browser is a client application. It communicates with the web server. The way that it communicates is using an application layer protocol called HTTP. And it's a relatively simple protocol. HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. A protocol for transferring hypertext. Hypertext is the format used for, dis for describing the content that we display on web pages. We use HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. So let's look at how HTTP works. It's a request-response protocol. That means, and it's used for web browsing, the way that it works is your client, your web browser, sends a request to a server, the server responds. So basically two types of messages, the request and the response. And it's very simple, there's no types of retransmissions, that's all handled by TCP. Just send a request, receive a response. If you want to get another resource, then send another request and you'll get another response. It's what we sometimes refer to as a stateless protocol. I send a request for a web page to a server, the server sends a response. The next request that I send is not related to the previous request. There's no state necessarily stored about the previous request. You can think the requests are independent of each other. I send a request to the Facebook web server, I get a response. One minute later, I send another request to the Facebook web server. 
I get a response. That second request and response in terms of HTTP is no dependence between to the first request. They're independent. There are other mechanisms, mechanisms to provide some dependency between them, things like cookies, but they are not originally part of HTTP. The client application we refer to as a user agent. Firefox is a user agent. Internet Explorer is a user agent. Safari is a user agent. So all those web browsers are client applications or more formally known as user agents in HTTP. And the protocol works in that the user agent sends a request message, a HTTP request message. And with web browsing, what we want to do as a client, I want to see some content, access some resource and see some content on my web browser. The web server stores that content, so I send a request for the content, the server sends back the content that I requested and it's displayed on my web browser. So I send a request for some content, or more generally, some resource. The server responds with some response message. We will look briefly about the structure of the request and the response message. I'll show you some examples. One thing we've mentioned before is that by default a web server uses port number 80. A client port number is usually chosen by your operating system, so that may vary over time. But most port most web servers use port number 80. And we'll see when, you, when a client tries to access a web server, it will assume that web server is using port 80 unless the user tells the client otherwise. So unless you type in the specific port number when you contact a web server, your user agent, your browser, will assume you're trying to contact port 80. So there are two types of messages, a request and a response. Both messages follow some general format and they're just text messages, just a, a sequence of uh, characters. The general format is that there's a start line, some line to indicate the start of this message. We'll see the structure of that. Both requests and responses can include optional header lines. We'll see some examples of those. Then we have a space, nothing, an empty line, and then maybe the message contents, especially in a response. I send a request for a file, the server's going to send back the file. That file is included in the message body. The start line differs for the request and response. The header lines we'll see have a simple format. We give a field name, the header field name, and its value. Let's see them in some details and through some examples. So this is a HTTP protocol exchange, an example. A web browser is the client, the web server is the server. The user, to start the protocol exchange at point one, let's say the user types in some domain name or some URL in their browser. or clicks on a link. So you know in your browser, so the user types in, let's say, a URL in the address bar. They type in the URL and press enter. Before this web page is displayed, after they press enter, that's at this point one. You press enter. What, that happen, what happens is that triggers your web browser to create a message, a HTTP request message. So your web browser creates a request message and the start line of that request message contains a string which looks like this. Get, followed by the URL that you're trying to access. The path part of the URL. So in this example, Let's say I typed in into the address bar
Let's say I type this into the address bar in my web browser. Here's the domain name, www.example.com slash test slash index.html. When you type that in and press enter, your web browser creates a request. It's going to send that request to the computer on the internet identified by this domain name. So in fact, this domain name corresponds to some IP address. For example, 72.16.3.4. How do we know that this domain name corresponds to this IP address? That's what DNS is used for. We haven't gone through how that works, but you can assume that given a domain name, DNS will find the corresponding IP address. So now your computer, if you type this in, DNS will go to work, find the IP address, so now you have the IP address of the server that you want to send the message to. So this is the IP address, or an example of the IP address, of our web server. So we create a HTTP GET request, where it has the string GET followed by the path, that is the path part of the resource I want to access, slash test slash index.html, which is just referring to some file in some directory at the server. The server has a database or a set of files that are accessible. Let's say in the server there are these files available. and there may be others. That is, on the server computer, there are a set of files available for web browsers to access, struct structured in some directories. We're requesting this particular file, the index.html file in the test directory. We create the request. This is the start line of the request. The request, in fact, can be much more complex, having more header values. Send the request to the server, when the server receives the request, it checks, does it have the requested file? Okay, the user requested test.index.html. It checks the files it has available. Okay, yes, it has that. It may do some other checks whether the requesting client is authorized to access it and sends back the file in a response message. So a HTTP response message has a start line and the typical format is to specify the protocol and the version of the protocol. There are different versions of HTTP. In this example, version 1.1 and some status message. That is, we send a request, the server is going to send back a status message saying your request was okay and give a number to indicate the, the status. 200 indicates that the, the request was OK. Then a space, followed by the contents of the file that was requested. So this is a HTML file. The response includes the contents of this file. If it was an image, a JPEG file that we requested, here would be the, the binary data for that JPEG. So the response includes some status plus the contents of what was requested. When your browser receives this response, it checks the status, everything was OK, takes the contents and displays them on the screen. So that's the very basic approach of HTTP. Send a request for a resource. If the server has that resource, it sends back the resource in a response one of the simpler protocols we've come across. Although I cannot show it, or I'm not going to show it in real time, when I typed in this URL and pressed enter, that triggered my browser to send a request to some server in the internet. That server 
identified by this domain name, which in fact is identified by an IP address. I send a request. I type in slash, and by default that would mean the file index.html. That is, if you don't type a file name, most web servers will assume you mean the file index.html. So I send a request to the Google web server in Australia, and that file existed, and the web server sent back the contents of that file to my browser. It's not a very good example because if we look at the contents of the file on this website, if we look at the page source, the Google website is a bunch of JavaScript. So, but that's the content of the message that came back to me. My web browser processed that content and displayed it on the screen. But note with the Google web page, it has some HTML, it also refers to some images. So there's an image here. When I sent the request for the HTML, I didn't request the specific image, image that was in that or referred to that in that HTML. I just requested the HTML page and I received that HTML file in response. Then when my br browser noticed that that HTML refers to some images, I needed to send separate requests for the images. So for any image embedded in this page, there will be individual requests for each image. A request for the Google logo .jpg, and I'd receive the logo back and then my browser would display it in the web page or on the screen. We'll see one more example after we go through the structure of the headers. So very simple protocol, send a request, get a response. The request message, the first line, the general format of this first start line is the method that we're using, the URL that we're requesting, and the version of the protocol that we're using. There are different types of methods, get, head, options, post, the most common one we will see, the others are used, but the most common one we'll see is get. Simply meaning we want to get the resource identified by the URL. And the version is the version of HTTP used. Say HTTP version 1.0, version 1.1, 1.2, there are different versions. So that's the, the start line of the request message. That's this. I didn't show the version here. In fact, it should be here. Post is used if we want to send data to the server and get the server to process that data. Get is used if we want to retrieve data from the server. And there are others. We send a request that request has a start line. It may have some header fields as well. We'll see a list of example header fields shortly. When we receive the response, the response has the version of the protocol being used, some status code, and some message corresponding to that status code, and then a space followed by the content. So the response, some version, status code, and the status reason, some textual description of the status code. Some, so there are many different status codes. Some of the ones you may see, the most common one, 200 OK. That means your request was successful and the response contains the content that you requested. Other ones you sh should understand. One that you've commonly seen, you request a resource that doesn't exist on the server. The server may send back 404 not found. If I send a request for instead of test.html but test page 2.html 
if I send a request for this resource, test slash page2.html, send it to our server, the server checks which files it has available. The requested file doesn't exist, page2.html doesn't exist on the server, therefore it sends back a response saying 404, that's the status code, the requested URL is not found on this server. You often see an error message if you request a access a site that's unavailable. It may say 404 not found. Sometimes web pages are password protected, like some of our course content. If you request a page and you don't have the correct username and password, you may receive a response like 401 unauthorized. You cannot access this content, you're not authorized to do so. <coughs> And another one you may receive, may see is you request test.index.html, the server has it, responds with 200 OK, and then a short time later, one minute later, you request the same page again. So you just request the same page, send it to the server, the server has it. Instead of the server sending back the same page again, it may send back 304 not modified, meaning the page that you just requested has not changed since the last time you requested it. Use the copy that you have in your local cache. So your web browser caches the values of the pages that it's previously requested and will use a copy in its local cache. That saves on transferring data across the internet. They are perhaps four status codes that you may commonly see, and you should know, know what they mean. 200 OK, 304 not modified, 401 unauthorized, and 404 not found. There are many others. Both the request and the response can include header fields. They're optional. That extra information that help with the to help the server to know what to respond with and to provide information to the client about what was requested. They are included after the start line. In this example, I don't show the header fields. They'll be included here and here. Some of the header fields are listed here. It's the field name followed by a value. For example, the date and time, a common thing that's used. If you supply your username and password, then that may be included in the authorization header field. So when you access and download the lecture notes and the quiz questions for this course, you need to supply a username and password. So that username and password is sent by your browser to the server. That is included in the authorization field. The content length, some information about the, the encoding or format of the content that comes in a response, and many other fields. I think they're best explained through some examples. So here's an example of multiple requests. Let's say in your browser you type in a URL, you want to access the ITS323 website and download some content. You type in the URL, press enter, your browser creates a request, a GET request, sends to the server, the server processes, checks whether the requested resource exists and sends back the content in a 200 OK message. Then sometime later you click on a link inside that page. The page is displayed on your browser, then you click on a link. You read the page, click on a link, then that triggers another request for the page that, uh, you, that was linked to. You click on a link to test.html and your browser sends a request for that page. The server sends back the page and is then displayed on your web browser. 
if that page includes references to images or other resources, then your browser will automatically send a request for those images. So if the test.html page included an image in it, one image referred to in the HTML, what happens? You request the page, the server sends back the HTML, your browser shows the HTML on the screen, but your browser also identifies that there's a reference to an image in this HTML and therefore automatically sends a request for that image. The server sends back the image and then it's displayed on your screen. And then if you enter in some URL and if it doesn't exist on the server, the server may send back a 404 not found message. Of course, not including any content. So just a simple example of multiple requests and responses. We can think, send a request, get a response. Request, response, request, response. Let's so show some real examples. The first example, when, when I typed in this URL and pressed enter, then my browser sent a request to the server. It may have sent multiple requests and eventually the web page was displayed. I did this not long ago, 20 uh, while you're doing the quiz, and I captured the messages which were sent from my computer and received by my computer. Let's look at those messages. It, there's a lot of information here, but we'll just highlight the most important things. So this shows the set of messages that were sent by my laptop when I requested that web page and the messages that were received. Some time at which I sent the message, so it's ordered in terms of time. Let's draw this as we go. And the IP address of my laptop is 10 10 251. And we'll see shortly the IP address of the server is 209 209 85 175 99. So what I did as the user is typed in the domain name that I wanted to access. When I type that in and press enter, my web browser, the first thing that it needed to do before it sent the HTTP request was to find the corresponding IP address. That is, I need to know, my web browser needs to know what is the IP address for this domain name. So it uses DNS. It's not part of HTTP, but we see that there were two simple messages that were sent here. My computer sent a request for this domain name, a query. It sent it to a special DNS server on the SIT network, 10.10.10.9, some other server. It sent a request saying, I want to know the IP address for this domain name, a query for this domain name. And we can see that that server, 10.10.10.9, sent a response back to my laptop saying, here's the response. So this is illustrating DNS at work. If we highlight the response, we can see it.
So, this is not HTTP, but it's DNS working. My laptop sends a request to a special DNS server. Tell me the IP address for this domain name. That DNS server sends back a response to my laptop, including the answer. And in this message, if we look into the details of that message, we'll see somewhere the answer. That is, here's the, a set of domain names, and it tells me a set of possible IP addresses for that domain name. One of them here is what we see is the IP address we use for our server. It's a little bit more complex in that the Google web server has many IP addresses. There are many physical servers distributed across the internet. So I just choose one of these addresses. So that's DNS working. Now my computer knows the destination address. And now we want to send our HTTP request. HTTP uses TCP as a transport protocol. Before we can send our HTTP request, we must first set up a TCP connection. And when you answered in your quiz, you would have drawn these three TCP segments. See what they are. Remember this orange one highlighted, my laptop, the Google web server. I send a TCP segment and the SYN flag is set. This is part of our TCP connection establishment. Send a SYN segment to the server. It would have an initial sequence number. If we looked into the detail of that segment, we would see the initial sequence number. What comes back from the server to my laptop is a message with a SYN flag set and the ACK flag set. The SYN flag, also there will be some sequence number set to some value. And some ACK number. I don't know the values, I need to look in the, the details here. We're not going to do that right now. We can find it from here. The SYN, the SYN ACK, and then finally the ACK from my laptop to the server. And that includes some acknowledgement number. So those three messages are just establishing the TCP connection. Before we can send our HTTP request, we must connect from the client to the server using TCP. Once we're connected, then we can transfer data from the client to the server and server to client. We see the next message to be the data that we want to send. Sin, sin ack, ack. Then the next message is the data that is being sent from the laptop to the server. TCP data. And the TCP data is our HTTP GET request. GET slash and the version of the protocol. Where slash will be interpreted as GET the index.html file in most cases. So my laptop sends a request to the web server indicating what resource it wants to request. The next packet here is an acknowledgement. So this is TCP data. And then we see a TCP ACK. So we could look at the individual sequence numbers and check that the ACK number makes sense compared to the sequence number of the data. 
So that's this segment 282 here is an at. And then if we keep going over here, the next segment or message is the response from the web server. So TCP data contains the HTTP request. The server sends a TCP act saying it's received that request or received that data. And then the server sends a response to the HTTP request. And we see the response has the protocol version and 200 OK. And in fact, if we look in details of that response, we'll see it contains the web page that we requested. If I look in the details of this packet, the orange one selected, we can see the details here. Uh, we, the header in that response includes the date and time of the response and some other header fields. The content type, that it's HTML, the character set used, some cookie values it includes some format of the encoding and it turns out in this example the response that comes back let's say index.html the server compresses that and sends it back in a compressed form it's encoded using some zip encoding and some other header fields. The content length, 12,514 bytes, and some other fields. And then contains the actual web page, the first set of bytes of that web page. And we can see that. you can see or you may notice so this is the content of the message so we had the start line some header fields and then we have the content of index.html and we can see or we may you may recognize some of the HTML here that these are some HTML tags at the top of the message at the top of that page so in fact this wasn't compressed I was wrong it's not so easy to see there but if you look into the detail you'll see that this is the HTML of the file that's displayed on my web browser. You can see that it's got some title, some refers to some Google script. What's shown there is in fact, if I view the page source here, it's all of this. All of this, the contents of that page, are what's included in here. That is what is included in our response message. So coming back. The web server has sent to my laptop the response, including the content. When my web browser receives that response, it displays it on the screen. It displays this HTML on the screen. It uses the markup. And we also see some acknowledgement coming back. My computer sends an ACK, a TCP ACK.
And in fact, in this case, the web page was too large to fit in one TCP data segment. TCP broke it into multiple segments. This is the first segment, and then we see some continuations of that data, some more segments. So we get something like this. Data, act. Data, act. And there are multiple, we can keep going down here. Where the data is in fact TCP segments containing all of this web page that I requested. So the response, the web page is split into multiple TCP segments, sent to my web server, uh, to my web browser, and my web browser combines them all together and displays the HTML on the screen. I'm not sure if we'll see it. In fact, it continues in many segments. And in this example, remember the Google web page has a logo on it, an image. So after I received the entire web page, I rec my browser recognizes there's an image referred to, so it then requests that image. It goes through the similar steps. A DNS query, set up the connection to the server that stores the image, and request the image, the logo for the Google website. And then it retrieves the image. In fact, there are multiple images on this website. And we receive the images, and then they're displayed in the web browser. I'm not sure if we'll see closing connection. And it keeps going. The images are quite large, and therefore there are multiple TCP segments to retrieve those images. I think that's sufficient for that example. The main point, we saw three things. We saw DNS at work, which maps a domain name to an IP address. We saw the TCP connection establishment, and you know how to do that because you answered in your quiz, the SYN, the SYNAC and ACK, with the corresponding sequence numbers and ACK numbers. Once the connection was established, our web browser sent data to the server. That data was a HTTP GET request. And eventually the server sent back a response the HTTP response. And that response includes the content of the resource that we requested. Any questions on how HTTP works or the basics of HTTP? Yes. This was our TCP connection. SYN, SYNAC, ACK. And then we sent another TCP segment with the data. This is a data segment. Optionally, we could have included these in one segment. We could have performed piggybacking. Send the ACK as well as the data. It didn't in this example, but in theory it could send both of them in one segment. Easy? <coughs> Maybe. What's not easy? The details that we've got all here, that's not the point. The point of this example is to show just the demonstration of set up a connection, send a request, send a HTTP request, get a HTTP response. If the web page has images referred to it, referred to in it, then we'd have to send separate requests for those images. That's the main point that we want to cover from this example.
I won't ask you to understand this in an exam. We will cover this next semester in our networking lab, this software. Next slide. We're finished. That covers, that covers for the entire semester from how do we transmit bits as signals across the physical layer up until how do we, how do specific applications transfer data across the internet using web browsing as an application. So we've gone all the way from the bottom layer up through the five layers to the application layer. Question? Uh, try it. You try it and find out. You can try. So that's it for this course. Well done. You've made it through to the end, uh, but you still have the exam to, to go, uh, which is what, worth 35%, I think. So you still have one or two weeks before that exam. What you need to do is look at the past exams, uh, practice from the past exams, questions are usually similar. Um, getting closer to the exam, I'll give you some more hints about what the exam this year will look like, but it won't be much different from previous years. Um, and that's all I can think of at the moment. So well done, we're finished, and we'll see you in the exam, and then we'll see you next semester to do some more practical aspects of networking and some of you some more details in internet technologies. Thank you.